<laughs> so um, just going to do some quick updates at the beginning, and then we'll hear from one of our committees, and then we'll be doing weeds with Nan Lin, which is great. Yay. So um, yeah, it'll be great. It's like really fun. Um, so everybody's fine, right? Nobody, yeah. it didn't get weird for anybody. OK, good. Um, so I actually take that as a really good endorsement that most of what we're doing is working pretty well, um, which I think is really exciting. You'll notice some little things like um, we're switching more to these types of masks. Um, if you want to, if you ever forget your mask, we always have extras. I bought like a hundred of them, um, so that's good. We unfortunately cannot have masks. Um, we cannot have our speakers unmasked anymore. But I bought a little. Nan's got a really cool thing that makes her look like a docent at a museum. <laughs> Uh, we're going to see how that goes. We're going to do the best we can. Um, unfortunately, when you get the attention of county public health, that's not a good thing. And sometimes you have to make some compromises. Um, the other thing I will say is that um, I'm going to be a little bit more ruthless about uh, mask enforcement. So if you see me turn around in my chair and lock eyes with you and your mask is not over your nose, that's what that means, right? So, um, and we will be. We've shifted our schedule a little bit. Some classes will be online. We will still be doing the majority in person. The ones we're doing online are the ones that just don't have a hands-on component at all. Um, and so they can be moved online. And I'll talk to you about that schedule. This is uploaded to the internet now. But just to go over it really quickly, this is our syllabus. You guys should feel like you have seen this before. The updates to this are at the end. Next week, which is lawn care and diseases, will be online. Um, I think you'll actually appreciate that because it gives you a chance to move around. It gives you a chance to kind of like stretch your legs during that because that's a topic that for some people can be a little bit dry. So it's nice to be able to like do some of this while you're watching that. So you'll get a Zoom link for that? You'll get a Zoom link for that, um, yes, today. <laughs> you'll get a Zoom link for that today. Uh, the following week will be rain gardens. We'll do the first ha half of class like this. And then we will actually take a field trip, um, location TBD, to look at a rain garden in person. And so I actually think that the changes we've been forced to make make the class a lot better. But you'll see that a lot of the structuring is like we're trying to minimize the time spent in the classroom. right? So that'll be really fun. We'll get to go see a rain garden in person. We'll get to talk it over with our um, teacher. That'll be really fun. Um, wildlife damage prevention and propagation, I'm still trying to figure out if we can figure out a way to do that in person or if that one will move to Zoom. Fruit and remember we have no class on Veterans Day. And then fruit and nut production is actually really fun. We're actually going to go to the Buster Sykes Orchard out in Alamance County. This is an amazing experimental orchard site. Uh, and we'll be getting a full blown like pruning demo and everything else from Mark Daniel, our speaker. Because a lot of the actual cultivar selection and everything you can get from the book, it's the pruning and the hands-on that is really essential and it's hard to learn from just reading about it. And then finally, we have one day added on one of our like snow days is what they were, 12-2. Uh, that's a diagnostics exercise and basically celebration. That's in person. I know that that's an extra day. And for a lot of you, um, your schedules might not be 100% flexible. So. I would love to see you there if you cannot make it work because you're like, I didn't ask for that time off. That's fine too. Um, but I would love to see you there. So do we have any questions about this? Makes sense? Cool. All right, yeah. We <laughs> clawed our way back. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to the social media committee. This is Araya April, April and Malitri Darnielle. These are both re the most recent class, right, 2019? Um, they took this and ran with it from uh, its founder, Julia, who actually just left us, which is a bummer. But she moved. It's like she wanted to be with her husband instead of us. It's fine. Um, so I will just turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So many amazing people here. Whenever, um, I hope to speak with you all individually at some point. I'm so excited for you all. My name is Araya. It rhymes with Mariah. I am a, a member of the class of 2019, um, and? Oh, Lily Tree, Darnell, same. Cool. Class of 2019. Yeah, good class. In this very room, so such a short time ago. <laughs> it feels like years, too, though. <laughs> Great COVID. It does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we are your social media committee. Uh, we're going to try to keep this under 10 minutes. Uh, there will be opportunities for you to connect with us later. So um, my goal 
goal for you for this presentation, really, there are three things to tell you more about what we do for the Master Gardener program. Uh, I'd like for you to contact us more if you have questions or if you want to be an active sorry, committee member. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. You've got a mouse. <laughs> I've got a mouse. So, okay. We um, would love for you to engage with us on social media and to consider being a uh, committee member. Is that better? Cool. So why social media? Um, it's a meaningful way to spread information. Uh, you'll see some goals here. Ideally, our team is reaching new and diverse audiences for free. We're also highlighting our various volunteer um, events in the community. You are going out into the community doing awesome things, and we want to showcase this on our social media. Um, we also want to entice strong Master Gardener volunteers or candidates to join the program, just like you have. And um, during times like the pandemic and we can't meet in person, social media allows us to really reach out to the community still. So our ultimate goal as account administrators is to spread, to spread accurate, unbiased, sustainable gardening knowledge. A little housekeeping. This is a timeline of the history of our, our committee. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, it's not yet. Um, sorry, Ashley, I'm having a hard time with the mat. Um, so you can find our social media committee page on the internet at this link. Um, it also says our annual committee reports, resources we're using to guide our activities. Um, it also includes the official social media policy from the North Carolina EMG guidelines. Those are our best practices, so we do refer to those for our activities. And I want to give a shout out to Wanda, who's not here today, but Wanda for keeping us all organized on the internet. She does an amazing job. So a little history about the committee. Um, as Ashley said, uh, Julia Fiore was our first committee chair. Um, in 2015, she wanted to expand how we were reaching people and allow us to reach more people. Um, so there was an existing radio gardening page on Facebook, and she transitioned that into our Master Gardener for the Durham County um, Extension Office page. Um, she relocated to the Garden State, so we're going to forgive her about that. But it's their asset and our loss. Um, Lily Tree joined our team last year, and she's really leveled up her online presence on Facebook with really high quality. Um, content. I can't get it to scroll. Um, so the two of us are. Yeah. How do I? How do I see my notes? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So um, there are two of us now, and it would be awesome if there were more than two of us. But you can see that uh, from our efforts in January 2020, we had almost 700 Facebook followers. Now we have almost 1,200. And um, in January 2020, we had um, 159 followers on Instagram, on our new Instagram account, and um, now we are at almost 1,000. So that's a big leap, and our activities are, are working. Uh, let's see, so this is, uh, these are our accounts on our social media. Uh, we have a Facebook account at Durham Master Gardeners, and Instagram at Durham NC Master Gardeners. Um, I think we've had a link known from our main page. I don't know. Um, so you can follow these if you have Facebook and or Instagram. Um, please like our posts if you see them. You know, if you like them, but do like them. <laughs> <laughs> and sharing them is actually really helpful because um, the more that you engage with our posts by liking and sharing, the more other people see the posts because of the mysterious algorithm that controls our lives. Mm -hmm. um, so that helps us then reach more people to further our mission of delivering um, research-based information to the community. And I think that's super important because people just don't know that this awesome resource exists. And social media is a really good chance for us to, um, to show them, to put it in front of their faces with the algorithm. So sharing and liking, super important. Um, let's see. You can also just post about, I've posted on my just personal Facebook page, I was like, hey, Here's the Durham Master Gardener's Facebook. You could, you know, check it out. And we got like a lot of likes from that. So just posting about our stuff too really works. Um, oh yeah, and then we just have a few different organizations who often share our content. Durham Hub Farm, which is a Durham Public Schools. Um, and then some other Master Gardener accounts often kind of interact with us. So it becomes a network. Uh, okay, um, this is, an example of what makes a really good post. Um, photos are always great. 
algorithm loves photos. Um, people, I think, like gardening tips and info, especially seasonal things, like what to do right now. I, don't, I think I like that kind of stuff, because I'm never that, <laughs> I'm never like on top of it. So if I'm like, no, it's time to see carrots now, then I think that's really helpful. Um, announcements for events, blog posts, um, volunteer activities is another one of my favorite types of posts, things that we do. Um, really helps, I think, the public to see what we're all about. Um, so I like those a lot. And just other facts, things, anything, anything research-based, um, preferably from NCSU and associated websites, is all fair game, and photos that you take. Um, here's an example of a volunteer activity, just a table at a site that may be a German Garden Center. Um, we, if, the, if we are in the picture, then we don't have to worry about like photo releases, because we're all signed releases. If you don't want to be in a picture, let us know. We don't want to force you to be in a picture. Um, but I love these two because it just shows what we do and helps uh, give the public an idea of what we do. Um, I, made, I posted one last year about a, a mushroom uh, workshop that we had out at Briggs. And people, like, we got good questions about it. We got questions about, like, when can I get another one of these? You know, so it was really engaging. Uh, let's see. So your next time you're volunteering, please take some pictures and send them to us or write a post and send them to us. We love to put that on our social media pages. We love it. Um, and this is a little hard to maybe see, but you can tell this is our like most popular post ever. Uh, up the top there it says 17,425 people reached. So this post about uh, swallowtail caterpillars has reached 17,000 people in the last you know, three years. Um, and this is just by being shared. So, let's see, let's share 300 shares or something like that. No, how many shares? Oh, I can't tell. 594 likes, comments, and shares. All of those just, it's exponential. Um, so this is the record for the number of people seen. Um, and it's a great way to help us get new followers as well. See it, they go, oh, that looks good, informative, follow. Um, I think that's the last one. Yeah, cool. Um, so for those of you who are thinking about joining the social media committee as an active poster, there's a variety of topics and a variety of approaches you can take to a topic. So um, for example, we try to cover various gardening um, knowledge levels, right? So the post on the left shows a more nuanced approach in terms of content. Um, it's targeting audiences who already have some kind of foundation of gardening knowledge, maybe. Um, you know, they can recognize what weeds are, they uh, want to learn more like we do about them and how to control them. Um, and these types of um, audience members generally engage with that by sharing their own tips or asking more questions, that kind of thing. Um, on the other end, we also post content that's ideal for gardening movies. So on the right, you see more of a Friday fun fact. Um, it's kind of an eye-catching graphic or a meme that is shareable. Um, and so this might be um, more basic, especially for an audience like we have here, but um, they kind of catch fire sometimes with um, other other audiences and uh, they're shared. And what we're doing there is we're building trust with them. They know that they can rely on us for information that's useful, helpful um, right now, and they wanna share that with their community. So if you wanna create content for our Facebook and Instagram, you can consider that there are a variety of audiences, um, you know, the established versus new, uh, Spanish-speaking gardeners, that's not an audience that we've um, really ventured into. We would love to do that. Um, anyone on social who'd like to learn more about sustainable gardening. So it's wide open for you. Uh, you can also create posts across gardening topics. So draw on your interests and what you're learning and your experiences and the questions that you're answering in your own life right now about your garden. Uh, logistically, Leitri and I are trying to cover maybe two to five posts a week, a work week. Um, and that doesn't seem like a lot, but we try to be intentional, you know, well research, have the photos that we can use, um, that kind of thing. So we can use your help if you're up for it. Um, if you'd like to post something, just say twice a month on a specific topic, like topiary, we're up for that. Happy to work you into our editorial calendar. Um, if you're already looking up questions for maintaining your own garden, answering your neighbor's questions, that kind of thing, 
Um, that's perfect fodder for creating content, right? Um, and so let's see what else we have. Oh, um, one logistical thing that might make it simpler in, in terms of how we manage posting is that we use the Facebook interface and we create one post and it goes both to Instagram and Facebook, right? So there is some efficiency there and we're happy to get anyone trained up on it. If you don't want to use social media, uh, but you do want to create content, we can also work with you to, we would actually do the posting if you wanted or if you wanted uh, to post yourselves, you do that too. So this is our last slide. Our main goal in 2022 is really to continue growing our reach because we have really awesome um, connection with community online and locally um, on social media. So how can we continue expanding that? We want to build the editorial calendar, uh, continue with quick facts and more nuanced content, um, maybe potentially work with Giving Tuesday for a little fundraising. There are lots of events that we can do online that are pretty cool and engaging. We want to continue photographing more events to show all the activities that we do in the community. Um, and of course, we have so much good content that's being generated within the committees, right? Um, so for example, Jackie or the Public Events Committee um, are constantly doing awesome things that we can uh, share online. So we are open to suggestions. If you don't want to be on the committee, but you do have feedback, we're always um, up for hearing it. You can email me directly or um, the two of us at this Gmail. Everything else got really hard in our program. Social media 
absolutely saved the day, took over. We are reaching so many more people. You guys are putting out such good content. Um, so if you're interested in this at all, this is actually one of the, the best ways to reach the most people. Um, and you can do it pretty basically. So, yeah. Cool, <laughs> yeah, let's connect. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you basically just, you know, if, if you take a picture and then maybe you spend a little bit of time editing it or you just do it, but then you put a paragraph together and to research the paragraph and feel good about it, you took an hour, right? That's an hour. So it's an easy way to rack up time. Style it exactly. <laughs> I keep messing with the post. It can take 45 minutes to make a post. But yeah. Probably totally. should. Hey, man, you take your time. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, switching gears. Um, we are up. So, Nan, what class were you? Dawn of Time. Okay, so Nan was in the Dawn of Time um, class, but no. So she is um, a former Master Gardener with Durham County, but we were lucky enough to rope her back in for this because this was one of her absolute specialty classes. Um, do you prefer having a clicker or do you mind just... Oh, I think this way? Just, yes. Yeah, okay. Me. Show me that. Okay. okay. That, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... Hmm? Uh, no, I'm no, gonna no, no. Sorry. No, I'm going to turn it over. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Is that okay? I am just a little nervous. It has been a long time since I've done a talk. But weeds are kind of my thing, I have to say. Um, I, uh, <laughs> sorry. All right, let's just start with this. What's a weed? What's the, in the wrong place? Yes, the classic definition is a weed is a plant in the wrong place. I like this definition, even though it is such a cliche, because it just implies that it's a plant that is out of context. It is not in the place where it's desirable. All right, I think of weeds as our opponents. Don't think of them as our enemy. I think of them as our opponents. It's an ongoing match, us against them. We have skills, they have skills. We have weaknesses, sloth. <laughs> they, they have weaknesses where we can kill them. So, but I respect weeds, and anybody who's killed a Daphne would love to have a weed that would, would love to have a Daphne that survived like a weed. All right, I like this definition. It comes from a 1965 article. I like it because of these words that it pulls out. Weeds are adaptive. They thrive. They're abundant. They're difficult to eradicate. And they become because of human disturbance. We, as gardeners, have created this contest that we're in. If we didn't do anything, we would not have weeds. I should mention. <laughs> Sorry. I should also mention that I'm following exactly the, um, the chapter. If you've read the chapter, this is review. If you haven't read the chapter, this is a sneak preview. <laughs> now, weeds are wildflowers. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to weigh in on this. This is something everybody has to decide on their own what they are. Dandelions have kind of been rehabilitated lately because of their seen as providing nectar and pollen. This is kind of a new thing. We used to be just, you know, fierce about eradicating dandelions. Well, there you go. Violets again. Now, if you love lawns, you hate dandelions and, and violets. If you like butterflies and bees, you're a big fan maybe of dandelions and violets. When you have someone come to you in the office or at, a, at an event, always remember that somebody's coming from a perspective. You have to kind of acknowledge their perspective. You may love dandelions, but they may love a golf course kind of green. So you got to meet them there. Um, 
I have to, I have to apologize to Virginia Buttonweed. Um, it is a native plant, and I hate that plant. And <laughs> I'm inclined to like native plants, but this one I could find no redeeming value for. Then I happened, I was researching for this talk, I found out that there are beetles that like Virginia buttonweed. It apparently has some value. So for me, Virginia buttonweed, great in my drainage ditch, not good in my yard. Again, it's a context kind of thing. Why we don't want weeds, however charming some of them may be, and some of them are, they are up against the plants we paid money for, all right? They're fighting our plants for water, nutrients, and sunlight, and that's why we want them out, because we put in some good money, spent some time putting in the plants that we love. You also have to consider that weeds can be um, the insects, the pathogens, Ragweed, poison ivy. Last year, this very time, I foolishly, stupidly grabbed some poison ivy. I knew I'd done it. And I did this vague little hand washing thing. Oh my <laughs> God. I was covered, coated. It was terrible. I hate poison ivy. But remember, too, that it's, it's one of the things you have to fight. And if you have a weedy area, like I do, I have a lot of weedy areas. That's where that poison ivy came in. It caused me some real pain. It was with glee and gusto that I drowned that in Roundup, I have to <laughs> I think in some ways edible weeds are kind of, uh, it's sort of the ultimate revenge. You know, if, you can't, if you can't get rid of all of them, you can also eat some of them. Um, the, there is a table in your chapter that has wonderful links to, to the weeds that are edible. It gives a lot of detailed directions on how to prepare them, get them when they're young. Um, and I don't do that. <laughs> sloth is kind of a, sloth is my biggest vice. Anyway, so I don't, it's, it takes a lot of work to gather enough chickweed to put it into my salad. Plus, I'm not really sure I can explain that to my husband exactly. <laughs> so, I don't, but I admire people who do. And, and foraging, I don't know how much you run into people who forage or you forage. It, it, I, I admire the thrift of that. The idea of using what looks like waste areas and using it for um, sustenance. Um, you have to know what it is. You have to know what it is. Certainly, you're not going to go out into your lawn after true green has come through and pick up anything. Uh, don't pick up stuff from the side of the road. Yeah. Um, you have to know what it is. And I like this idea here. If you decide to do this, take a little bit at a time and see if you have a reaction to it because you don't really know. It's not like there's a little tag that comes with the weed that says may cause. You have to know what it is and take it sort of slow. Uh, poisonous weeds, this gets into, you know, poison doesn't just mean dead, it also means violently ill. Um, I, the, the toolbox gives you a lot of great information on what is poisonous and how it will affect you. But always remember, if someone calls you up and says, I think I've eaten a poisonous weed, you get them to the poison center or to a doctor. This is not our job to ever give anybody any medical advice. Don't spend any time with it. Just move them on and, and you know, time is of the essence there. Okay. All right. Yes. Would you put that back so I can write down the point? Sure. There you go. You get it? Yeah. Hey, that's how the arrows work. Really cool. Uh, <laughs> got it? Okay. I did want to say um, I appreciate that people brought in weeds. I seriously hope by the end of this day you will have the tools to figure it out, but we will also kind of figure out some of these weeds. I also want to tell you that um, I've been thinking about this class for like three solid weeks, and I have had no trouble at all digging up weeds. I think I dug up 70 weeds so that you could have 
beautiful weeds to identify. But because I've been thinking about this for so long, um, I want you to pay attention to the photos that I put up as I go. Some of them may help you in the weed identification exercise. I'm not trying to trick you and I'm not trying to be sneaky. <laughs> but those weeds there and the weeds that I have up here, you may be able to use some of this information. Part two. All right, weed life cycles. Life cycles. Anytime you're up against an opponent, you want to know what their strengths and weaknesses are. Once we have this information at hand, you can start to figure out where your opponent is vulnerable. Winter annuals, summer annuals, biennials, and perennials. Those are the basic four kinds of weeds. What's going on right now? What's going on in your yard right now? What's happening to your weeds? No, don't They're tell flowering. me. You, you don't have weeds. I was afraid to <laughs> nobody has weeds. I was say, if I'm speaking to a bunch of perfect gardeners, I'm just going to go home and cry. Um, what, flowering? Flowering and setting seed. Flowering and setting seed. And which, which annuals are these? The summer. The summer annuals are doing that. This is your basic life cycle. They germinate from seed, they grow flowers, produce seeds, and die. Annuals live fast, die young. That's what annuals are. Perennials and biennials, a little more strategic thinkers, if you will. They invest a little more time into their, really, the underground. They spend a lot more time there. I like to think of roots, uh, I like to think of roots as the plant's home. You know, above ground is where they go to work. Below the ground is where they live. For perennials and biennials, that's where you want to hit them hard, where they live. Oh, I had this. It didn't translate. I had this in the chiller font because it's Halloween, and I wanted to give that sort of, you know, take advantage of the time. You can read this. This is what's happening right now. All of these plants that are in your yard, that are summer annuals, they are this minute set in seed for you next year. There is not a lot you can do about this now. If you haven't pulled them up, um, you can run home right now and pull them up. You'll save yourself some weed seeds. But a lot of this, this window is kind of closing. Uh, here are some examples. I, was, I thought it was great that the people before had the Japanese stilt grass. How many of you have that? Microstesium? Yeah. I'll just show you something kind of interesting. I wanted to pot it up because I have lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, right now it's really tall and rangy. It's easy to pull and it's setting seed. But then I found this. At first glance, you wouldn't think this is Japanese stilgrass, but the truth is it's in an area that gets mowed, so it's been mowed constantly. It's much thicker, it's much denser. I don't see a seed head on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. All right. Winter annuals, the flip. Yes. Oh, sure. Sure. Know your enemy. <laughs> uh, the winter annuals is just the flip. You know, set seed and die in the summer. Here's some examples. Oh, yeah. This is really great. I love how big these pictures are. All right. Oh, there's the annuals. Yeah, this is kind of creepy. Um, annual bluegrass. We have uh, True Green comes out and looks at our yard. There was mentioned that. Yeah. Well, it covers the ground. This is kind of how I feel about it. All right. Biennials are a little kind of an odd duck in a way. Um, 
there aren't so many biennial weeds. They're mostly, you see that in um, uh, ornamentals. Um, but it's kind of interesting that they have a two-year strategy towards growing. Queen Anne's lace wool thistle. I haven't seen that. Did anybody see that? Wool mm -hmm. thistle? I've been lucky, I guess. All right. Perennials. This is where you see their different strategy. They do produce seeds, but you can see that they put a lot more investment into what's underground. And you can tell that when you pull a weed up. You can see what's there. It also helps if you know that what you have is a perennial weed. You need to look for all the little bits. You leave one of the nut sedge tubers in there, you're going to get another one back. It makes, um, it's, it makes you more mindful of what you're pulling up and how well you're doing. Annuals are just easy to come right up. This you kind of have to dig out. Take a look at the asparagus fork to get the, um, to get the fleshy, the, like the, ah, I've lost the term. But you know how dandelions are, you know, that long thing. You gotta watch for that, the long root. <laughs> Tapper. Tapper, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. All right, here's some pictures of what you've got underground. You can see how that's so different from a seed. It's a pretty simple root, pretty basic. Look at all the rest of that stuff. Spreads out wide. This is where they put their effort. It's harder to kill a perennial than it is an annual, just because they're so much more invested in the underground structures. This is a good time to do it, probably maybe a little bit earlier, actually. It's kind of evil if you think of it. Uh, in the fall, perennials, like trees, shrubs, everything you love, it's taking all the energy, putting it underground to prepare for the winter. It is kind of a, um, it's sort of a dark thing to put on there a systemic herbicide and let that poison sink <laughs> into the ground. But that's what it's doing now, and you might as well take advantage of that. I do. I do like to think of dark ways to torture him. <laughs> All right, what can we do? Here's your to-do list for right now. Early fall, I think that window has passed. Um, I was looking this up, uh, and the, you know, early fall is sort of wait a minute, I wrote this down. August to September. You know, it's really I think of that as late summer. But early fall is when you need to put down pre-emergence. And the same is true for spring. It's earlier than you think. Early March is the time to put down pre-emergence in the spring. So what I found when I was thinking about this, I have let my prestigium and mulberry weed run ragged through some of my beds. And I felt really guilty about it, so I felt that I was honor bound to pull it all up by hand as kind of penance. But now I'm thinking that's just stupid. There are herbicides, there are pre-emergence, and I can get out of this guilt trip, if you will. But I've got to remember early in the March to put that stuff down. Um, but I'm also going to scatter wildflower seeds. So clearly, I'm not gonna put pre-emergence in the same place where I'm scattering wildflower seeds. I also have microcesium in my vegetable garden I'm not going to put pre-emergent in there either because I may want to plant lettuce leaves and lettuce seeds come spring. So those are things to think about. Um, in the winter, really mulching, that's kind of what your strategy is. Spring, you got a little more options going on. Get them while they're young. That's one thing you can do when the seeds start to come up. Um, I like to hand pull, but what's interesting to me is that they say that hand pulling, if you think about it, after a good soaking rain, you pull it up by, by hand and you get that root and it's great. Slips right out of the ground. Awesome. Once it starts to dry up, the, weed, the weeds don't come up so easily. So sometimes you're taking your trowel and you're digging them up. Well, every time you open up that soil, all those little weed seeds that have been sitting there just waiting for some sun are like, yay, 
my time in the sunlight. This is something to think about. I've always taken it as kind of a field of honor. You know, I've dug in there and I've grounded out and I've pulled that baby up and all that. Look, look what I did. Caused myself more trouble. All right. Um, has anybody here done, uh, have done, have you done this? The flush of wheat, yes. So to that point then, if you're thinking that digging it up might not be a great idea, what will you do? One thing you can do is follow that up with mulch. So you get, if you can, if you dig up a whole area, you dig up all the weeds and it covered up with mulch, you've stopped the sunlight from hitting the weed seeds. And that's one of the things they've been waiting for. That's kind of your best strategy. So the mulch will stop the new seeds. Would it kill the um, a developed plant? If, like if you've got sort of a established weed there, yeah. and, you're, and you decide not to dig it up, but you cover it, we just covered out a whole area with mulch, and I'm thinking, you know, are they just going to thank, oh, thanks for covering us up and keeping us warm? <laughs> very good strategy. That's a very good strategy to do. Yes, you're covering it up. You're, you're going to suffocate a lot of things. It's not, it's not, you haven't solved it. It's not the end. The other thing that I read, and I had not really considered this before, but in the, on the line of not disturbing the soil, is you can just cut it off. And this is actually what I had done with the Virginia buttonweed in our, in our yard. Um, I would just pull off the top of it. Now, what is that doing? Well, I'm starving them, right? I'm pulling off what gives them the, the, does the photosynthesis. I'm giving, I'm pulling that all out. The weeds underneath aren't getting that nutrients. They're putting more energy into putting out leaves and stuff. The more you do that, the more you weaken the plant. And eventually it's not gonna be able, it's gonna spend so much time putting out leaves in order to survive that it's not gonna spend as much time putting out new seeds. That's a war of attrition, if you will. But depending on what you've got, it may be a way to go. Um, has anybody done solarization? I tried it a long time ago. I didn't feel very happy with it. And I don't know if it's really anything to try. You'll see it advertised as the, you know, the end all and be all. It won't get very far down. And weed seeds go really deep. I'm not sure what it does. I assume the earthworms know to head to higher ground or lower ground, as it were. But this is kind of my sadistic, is you know, you mow and you prune and you cut it back in the foliage, which is sort of a long-term torture. All right. This is the secret of weeds. Lots of seeds, a seed bank, and they travel all kinds of ways. Any way you can think of wind, water. I, sometimes I don't know how things show up. Sometimes they come in with other plants. Um, the thing I also think is interesting is weeds are also clues. Um, remember that they're very well adapted and they can survive in places that you might not think would be happy or healthy. This can sometimes tell you something about what you have going on. For example, moss, right? Moss tells you you've got wet, compacted, shady soil. Weeds are the same way. I have a lot of this. Do you have a lot of this? Do people see this? Dollar weed. Yeah. That's hard to get rid of. It's very tiny. Um, compacted soil, spurge, spurge is where it, you know, will grow concrete practically. <laughs> um, I love that one. We do all have favorites, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody has a favorite weed. Um, I have to admit I like plantains. I think they're cool. Dry soil. Which doesn't oh. mean if it won't be wet. I love that. 
it doesn't mean that if it's wet, it won't grow as well, but it'll also grow to dry. So, even though it's pretty. Now, do you have to know the names of weeds? You don't. Not if you're going to hand pull them, because you just decide, I don't like you, you're gone. I was new to this area, and I didn't know what was a wildflower and what was a weed, so that gave me a little impetus to spend some time trying to find out what things were. And uh, I, my background is a, a librarian, a cataloger, and we try to describe things and identify things. And I like mysteries. I like, you know, Sherlock Holmes, Columbo. They look at things and go, the detail that nobody else saw. And this lends itself to my interest in weed ID. You look for the little details, you look for the subtle things. But you don't need to do it mechanically. But if you have a perennial, it kind of helps to know because then you know what you're up against. If you're using chemicals, you really do need to know what you've got. Um, right now, you could go out and put chemicals on a weed and it would kind of be pointless because the, the weeds are ready to die now anyway. You can grab it up, but there's, there's no point to, um, especially the annuals, because they're gonna be dead in a couple of weeks as soon as we get a nice cold bit of, of weather. And anyway, don't waste the money on that. It helps if things are unusual. It helps if there are flowers. Um, I'm going to give you now. There are a lot of really cool um, websites to help you with weeds. Some of them will do a little bit like the NC State um, toolbox. Will you can identify characteristics and it'll walk you through them. I like Virginia Tech's a little bit better just because it's specifically about weeds. But you can sort of do a characteristics, and they can be pretty simple. But I would, but I really recommend that you look at these. Some of these sites have terrific pictures to help you identify things. How many of you use um, apps? Do you use weed ID apps? Or just any plant ID apps? Some of them are helpful. Some of them, I, you know, it kind of depends. I like doing it the hard way just because I feel more rewarded. <laughs> I put this up here again because of guilt. I misidentified one of these. I can't remember which one it was. But because I misidentified it, I don't want any of you to ever have to walk that walk. All right? Notice the difference in the leaves. See how that's very triangular? This is very ruffled. They're in the same family. The flowers are very similar. But it's that difference between the two leaves that kind of subtlety that you look for. Arrangement, we'll get into that in the weed ID um, exercise. Are they both annual here? Yeah. Yeah, they're, um, they're both probably germinating in my, at home right now. <laughs> <laughs> you get to know them, you know? They're you like your friends. Weed identification, monocots and dicots. What's a monocot? Grasses. Dicots, your broad leaves. It helps to know because when you get into herbicides, some affect grasses, some affect broad leaves. This is from before. You've probably seen this before on the botany. I'm not good at grass plants. I've kind of been intrigued by grass plants, but some of this is so, it's, um, this, this is so subtle, these collars, how the, how the leaf is attached to a grass. I like ornamentals, don't get me wrong, but I, I'm kind of, because I spend more time sort of dissecting weeds, I am astonished at the variety the different ways that a plant has used to create itself, to describe itself, how, it's, how it manifests itself. You look at those weeds there, they're all very different in form and style. It's kind of a cool thing, I think. I got a great, great appreciation, even as I kill them, which 
<laughs> sedges, sedges are tricky. Sedges have edges. That's the, the sort of the cliche. The nut sedges are tough. Um, I kind of, I've kind of given up, to be honest with you. I see a few nut sedges. I try to get them out, but you know, it's a lot. I used to pull them up by hand, but now they're taken over the back part of my property, and I'm just the hell with it. Yep. <laughs> There are sedges that are ornamental, uh, caraxes. I've been kind of exploring that a little bit as a ground cover kind of need. All right, let's talk about how we deal with it. This is a uh, this is a definition from EPA, but I liked it because of these two phrases: integrated pest management. You want to use the most economical means and the least possible hazard. Um, for us, for the people that we help, nobody's just got money to squander. If you have money, you've hired help. But if people are doing this themselves, you want to look at the most economical means. And this means being the most strategic when it comes to working with your plants. Um, first of all, just don't bring it in. That's the right, that's one thing. Um, if it's free, I uh, if you trust the person. We were just having a conversation in the other room. Um, several people said they got plants from a specific place and all of a sudden had weeds they had never seen before. And this will happen. I mean, it's uh, that's where a lot of weeds come from. Sometimes you can't help that. Nurseries can't always fight that off. But um, be mindful. Sometimes if it's a if it's a plant you've gotten from another person, you know, you might let it set in a pot for a while and see what it does. Put it in a spot where you can really mind it. Mechanical, this is kind of what I prefer. Um, I like to hand, I like to hand weed, even though they say it's less effective, but the mowing part, I kind of like that idea too, of just cutting it off at the edge, covering it with mulch, let it die on its own. Um, yeah, grass seeds, you'll cover that probably in lawns. Some grass seeds will indicate that they have a percentage of weed seeds because the people who grow grass seeds can't help that either. I'd love to have goats, but I don't, I don't think I have enough to feed them. Now, when you start to get into chemicals and herbicides, um, First of all, there's a cost to that. There's a certain element of poisonous to them, the chemicals. And you want to make sure you use them to get the most benefit. Um, you must always read the label to know how to apply it properly. A lot of them have a temperature requirement. Some of them are, well, we'll get to this in a second. I'm jumping ahead. Selective and non-selective. You have two options, you know, right? Selective gets specific things. Non-selective will kill anything green. Roundup will kill anything. If you use it on a windy day, you can kill a lot of things. Selective will control specific, specific plants, but you need to apply it in the right time. You can't just buy a pre-emergent or a selective herbicide and just think it's going to work today. Um, the contact, people, have people used horticulture vinegar? Has anybody used that? Some people spout that. If I make tea, I'll take the boiling water that's left over and kill what's in the cracks of the sidewalk. That's contact. It doesn't mean I got the roots, but I killed the top of it. Um, systemic, it's, it's really dark. It comes into the foliage and goes right into the roots. As I mentioned before, it kind of goes right into their home and kills them dead. Um, Pre-emergences, I've never used that in my beds. Has anybody used that? Yes, in your beds? I'm going to try that. You'll see that a lot in lawn care. They talk about pre-emergence all the time. The idea of a, uh, a pre-emergence 
is you lay it down and it forms a sort of a chemical barrier. The seed will germinate, but it'll never get any further. It won't grow a stem or it won't grow the roots. It just stops. Um, grasses, you have to get the right time though. And you don't want to be seeding anything like my uh, wildflowers. If, um, if, if you want to overseed or reseed your lawn, it's all fiscal year on September, uh, October. How far out should you use the free Yeah. You just can't. They're clashing. They're too. The herbicide is going after any seed and it makes no distinction between a grass seed and a weed seed. And you're wanting to put down grass seed, correct? So you need to pick. You need to pick which strategy you're doing, say, this year. Maybe this year you do overseeding, next year you do pre-emergent, vice versa. But they're two different strategies and they will butt heads. Yeah. My husband overseeded yesterday. <laughs> I'm not sure. Post-emergent, all right, that you can get any time. Um, I, I do literally get lost in the weeds here. This is, I don't use that many chemicals, but what's important is you know what it is you're gonna kill and you read the label because the label will tell you it's required. The label has to tell you what to use it for and when to use it. It's, um, Chemicals are amazing, but they have to be used with care, and you can't just slap it on. If you got something sitting in your garage, what the heck? No, don't do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is, has anybody used cream? I keep hoping cream would work, but I think I bought it and never used it. <laughs> Laziness. Yeah, I think I mentioned sloth. Um, also, uh, you also have to remember, like right now, you have an area maybe that is full of all kinds of summer annuals, or you have microstesia, like I do. I have to remember in March to go buy my pre-emergent, and it's easy to forget, unless I mark it on my calendar, it's easy to forget. Holidays, the happiness of spring, I'm not thinking about killing my prestigion because I'm so excited about daffodils. This is why you've got to think ahead. This is where we have the advantage over weeds. They have a timetable. We, we have calendars. Um, I'm going to give you the highlights of the North Carolina Agricultural Chemicals Manual. Have you seen this manual? No, do, do we have it? Yeah, we have it. Yeah. Very dense. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got a lot of wonderful information in it in certain areas. You can also find it online. It's really more intimidating, I think, as a book because it's a it's a you know a doorstop. It's a doorstop book. But this will give you some um, places to look. Some great information in there. You can skip all the herbicide stuff, some of the chemicals that are for the farmers. But of course, the farmers thrive on this stuff. They need this stuff. There's stuff in there for uh, homeowners. Always read the label. Always read the label whenever you're doing chemicals. Make sure you know what you're trying to kill. Tell me why it's the plant. 
I want you to use this as a chance. We've got hand lenses for you to use. We've got the books. There are internet sources if you want to use them. I want you to take this as an opportunity to actually do botany. I want you to look at the structures, look at the leaf arrangements, look at the leaf margins. Just give you a chance to kind of do your own detective work and analyze the plant. I don't want these things back. If you want to pull them up out of the pot, please. It's fine. It just saves me some effort. <laughs> um, we'll be out there to kind of help you. We'll talk about what it is. Uh, I want you to, the best way to do it is just be clear-eyed and just write down what you see. These plants here, so I think one of them has probably been identified if you've watched closely. Um, the others, I'm not sure what they are, so this will be kind of fun. <laughs> That's it. Are there any questions that you have? Is there anything I can help you with?